Welcome back everyone! Intel's recently released their new 10th gen Comic Lake desktop processors and we're super excited to dive in to share how these perform. But first, let's briefly go through some of the changes that 10th gen will bring. To start, we have to take this launch in context. Uh, it's been one crazy year. For the first time, Intel's taking the underdog position and playing catch up with AMD, and we'll see some of that effort realized in the specs of these new 10th gen CPUs. That being said, Intel still got some room for improvement, but you know, let's start by talking about what's good about 10th gen. First, Intel's enabling hyperthreading across all their 10th gen CPUs. Uh, traditionally, hyperthreading has always been a feature limited to higher end CPUs, like the core i7s and i9s of the past, but 10th gen has brought about a change to Intel's behavior, uh, likely due to the heat from AMD's Ryzen CPUs. The vast majority of AMD's processors have simultaneous multi-threading enabled, so it's good to see Intel finally offering hyperthreading across the board, especially for the more popular Core i5 CPUs. Next, Intel's also bringing more cores to their top-of-the-line Core i9 processors. The i9-10900, 10900K, and 10900KF will all come with 10 cores and 20 threads. Uh, this brings Intel's offerings one step closer to AMD's competing product, the 12-core 24-thread Ryzen 9 3900X. On top of that, Intel's new CPUs are faster than their predecessors. High clock speeds have always been, you know, sort of Intel's thing, and Intel's new Turbo Boost 3.0 furthers this by identifying the two most efficient cores and boosts the speed of those without increasing the voltage supplied to those cores, which is great because you get more performance without increased temperatures. In terms of design, Intel's 10th Gen CPUs will use the same 14 nanometer architecture, effectively making this a refresh of their 9th Gen CPUs. Uh, but some of these new processors will spot a thinner die and a thicker integrated heat spreader, or IHS, uh, which will likely improve the thermal performance of these new CPUs. Finally, pricing is more competitive. Uh, Intel's 10th Gen processors will launch with very similar prices as their 9th Gen predecessors at launch, which is good news, I guess. But the CPU needs a motherboard to work, and this is a good time for me to start talking about the bad stuff. Intel's new 10th gen processors will require the new LGA 1200 socket for compatibility. This socket has got 49 more pins than the previous LGA 1151 socket, and these extra pins will help power the more powerful 10th gen CPUs. But this also means that you'll need a new 400 series motherboard to work with these new processors. Next, Intel's not offering PCIe Gen 4 support on their new 10th gen CPUs. This is unfortunate considering how AMD's managed to charge ahead with PCIe Gen 4 on X570 and the upcoming B550 motherboard. On a brighter note, Intel's new 10th gen CPUs will support the, you know, well, now not so new, 802.11 AX Wi-Fi 6, but I guess late is better than never. Finally, I'm not sure this is a valid point, but I'll make it anyway. Intel's new processors will come with the same stock cooling solution that they've been using for ages. Uh, considering how AMD is offering pretty decent stock coolers with their CPUs, I find it odd that Intel's still relying on users to purchase aftermarket solutions for things like their unlocked K-series processors. If you think about it, not having a stock cooler bundle does increase the price of adopting a new CPU, especially for new users. So I'd like to see Intel come up with some improved cooling solutions down the road. Okay, we've gone through the good and the bad. Now, let's take a look at how some of these new processors perform. We'll be checking out the Intel Core i9-10900K and comparing it against the Intel Core i9-9900K, the AMD Ryzen 7 3800X and the AMD Ryzen 9 3900X. Our choice of motherboard for the i10900K will be the new gorgeous MSI MEG Z498s over here. Quick shout out to MSI for sending this one over. It's got a beautiful golden trim on most of its armor and supports the new A02.11 AX Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.1, two-way SLI, three-way crossfire, a 2.5 gigabit LAN port alongside a standard gigabit LAN port with just the right amount of RGB. For memory, we're using our good old trusted 16 gig kit of Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro. Its trademark timeless aesthetic complements the Z490A perfectly. We'll be doing some thermal testing with Corsair's new H100i RGB Pro XT that comes with a new pump design as well as two ML120 maglev fans for quieter performance with improved airflow. Uh, we'll also be using the MSI's RTX 2080 Ti Ventus GPOC, a beautiful card with a muted aesthetic that you can fit into any desktop. Let's get right to it. First up, we'll look at rendering performance on a number of benchmarks. We'll start with Cinebench R20 focusing on multi-core performance. Here, we see the 10900K performing 30% better than the 9900K, 20% better than the 3800X, but it falls behind the 3900X by about 13%. Moving on to single core performance, we see the variance here is far less. The 10900K performs 2% better than the 9900K, 1% worse than the 3800X, and is somewhat on par with the 3900X. Corona 1.3 is another multi-core render engine, and performance here is measured by the time taken to render a scene in seconds, so lower is better. 
Here we see the 10900K performing 45% better than the 9900K, 40% better than the 3800X, and it's just about 1% worse than the 3900X. Next, let's take a look at V-Ray. If you check out the CPU render scores alone, the story is quite similar to CityBench's uh, multi-core performance. We see the 10900K outperforming the 9900K by 40%. It's about 23% better than the 3800X, but it's 10% worse than the 3900X. When we turn on hybrid mode, enabling both the CPU and GPU on the VRA benchmark, the pattern of results remain similar, but to a smaller magnitude. The 10900K performed about 7% better than the 9900K, 3% better than the 3800X and was worse than the 3900X by about 5%. Finally, we use Blender's popular BMW render scene, so the shorter the time taken, the better. Here we see the 10900K performing 36% better than the 9900K, also 36% better than the 3800X, but about 6% worse than the 3900X. Moving on to synthetic benchmarks. With Geekbench 5 in multi-core mode, uh, the 10900K outperforms the 9900K by 25% and is better than the 3800X by about 18%, but loses to the 3900X by about 10%. When we look at Geekbench's single core scores, the 10900K comes up top, outperforming the 9900K by 5%, the 3800X by 6%, and the 3900X also by about 6%. WinRAR is another popular synthetic benchmark, and here we see multi-threaded performance. The 10900K comes up top, beating the 9900K by about 37%, the 3800X by about 34%, and the 3900X by about 14%. WinRAR's traditionally favoured Intel CPUs, so these scores may be slightly biased. Take that with a pinch of salt. Moving on to single threaded performance, the 10900K comes on top again, beating the 9900K by 22%, the 3800X by 18%, and the 3900X by 16%. 7-Zip is more platform neutral, so let's take a look at that. The 10900K beats the 9900K on compression by 37%, is better than the 3800X by 15%, and loses to the 3900X by about 19%. With decompression, the story is similar. The 10900K beats the 9900K by 24%, is better than the 3800X by 15%, and loses to the 3900X by 24%. Next, gaming benchmarks. With the Final Fantasy XV benchmark on 1080p at high settings, the 10900K comes out top and beats the 9900K by about 6%, the 3800X by 7%, and the 3900X by 6%. It's a similar situation on 3 Mark Time Spy. The 10900K comes out top again, beating the 9900K by 4%, the 3800X by 9%, and the 3900X by 3%. Finally, temperatures. We've got ambient temperatures about 30 degrees Celsius around here, and we see the 10900K coming in quite warm, but not warmer than the 9900K. So it looks like Intel's thinner die design does indeed work. Uh, we threw Prime95 with small FFTs on for about 30 minutes using a 240mm on among a CPU cooler from Silverstone, and saw the 10900K coming in at 90 degrees Celsius. That's about 2 degrees cooler than the 9900K, 7 degrees warmer than the 3800X, and 3 degrees warmer than the 3900X. It's worth noting that Prime95 does present an unrealistic thermal load, so we're really pushing the limits of these processors here, and you are unlikely to see these temperatures with regular use. Also, we're using an early engineering sample of the 10900K, whereas others may be using review samples. So let's take these temperatures with a pinch of salt. And there you have it, the Intel Core i9-10900K. Let's summarize. As expected, the Intel Core i9-10900K beats its predecessor, the 9900K, on every metric. When compared to the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 3800X, the 10900K has more cores, more threads, and is faster. So it's no surprise that the 10900K beats the 3800X on most things as well. The more interesting comparison is against the Ryzen 9 3900X. The 3900X has 2 more cores and 4 more threads than the 10900K, but the 10900K boosts up to 5.3GHz, whereas the 3900X only boosts up to 46 From this, we'd expect the 10900K to perform better on single-threaded workloads, and we see the effect in a number of places. On our gaming benchmarks, the 2080 Ti with the 10900K comes out top, and that's no surprise there. Similarly, the 10900K outperforms the 3900X on single-threaded workloads, and in a few rare cases, like in single-threaded Cinebench R20, performance is on par. But the 10900K is 2 cores and 4 threads short of the 3900X, and that makes it hard for it to beat the 3900X on multi-threaded workloads. We see the 3900X outperforming the 10900K on multi-threaded rendering applications like V-Ray, Cinebench R20, and other multi-threaded synthetic benchmarks. Overclocking the 10900K will certainly close this gap, but it won't make the 10900K better than the 3900X on multi-threaded workloads. So, is it worth it? 
Here in Singapore, the Intel Core i9 10900K launches in the ballpark of 850 to 900 Singapore dollars, and you can get the 3900X now for about 820 dollars. So where does that leave us? If you're an Intel fan, then there's not much to say. The 10900K is superior to its predecessor, with slightly improved thermal performance, but certainly much better performance on both single and multi-threaded workloads. When compared to the 3900X, the i9-10900K wins in gaming and single-threaded workloads by a slim margin, but loses out on multi-threaded workloads by quite large margins. Intel certainly taken a step forward from its 9th gen processors, but still has quite a long way to go to catch up with AMD. I mean, this is their new flagship consumer processor, right? And AMD has got the upper hand with both the 3900X and the 3950X, don't forget that. Coupled with the extreme value that AMD is bringing to the table, I find it hard pressed to recommend the i9-10900K to anyone but top level enthusiast gamers. So there you have it. If you were hoping for Intel's new 10th gen Comic Lake processors to be exciting, transformative and game changing like AMD's Ryzen 3000 series CPUs, I'm sorry but that's not going to be the case. The good news is, Intel's new 10th gen CPUs are catching up to what AMD is offering, and gamers are likely to benefit from what Team Blue is offering this time around, but content creators might still favour Team Red for their superior multi-threaded performance. Having said, realistically speaking, the 1000K might be Intel's flagship, but we've got a load of other SKUs down the line that may be more interesting to look at. The Intel Core i5-10600K and i7-10700K are now hyper-threaded 6-core, 12-thread and 8-core, 16-thread processors, so it'll be interesting to see how those perform against the Ryzen 5 3600X and Ryzen 7 3700X respectively. We'll likely take a look at the performance of these processors in our next video, but until then, let us know what else you want us to check out. Thanks for watching, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications. This is Eugene from Dreamhall, signing out.